everyone, it's Grace. Welcome back to my channel and to my living room. Uh, it's been a while since my last video, but it's a New Year's resolution of mine to get back into it. I think YouTube is about to have a resurgence again this year or the following. So uh, of course I wanna be on that train. I've been a YouTuber since 2009. So it's great to still be on the platform. I think it's such a great way to learn about uh, what we're going to talk about today, which is naval aviation, especially for people who don't have anyone in their life to ask questions to. So I hope that I'm that for you. Um, I've had quite a quite uh, a number of people help me throughout my career so far, and I'm I love to do the same thing and do uh, as much mentorship as I possibly can. So today we're going to be talking more about NROTC than anything else and how to select aviation from NROTC uh, when you're a midshipman and going through that process. If you are coming from a different accession source, which would be OCS, Officer Candidate School, or coming from the Naval Academy, uh, the process is a bit different. For people who are applying to Officer Candidate School, you'll definitely want to ask your officer recruiter about the steps to become an SNA, a Student Naval Aviator or an SNFO, a student naval flight officer. So that recruiter should be able to help you with those steps, uh, which will include an entrance exam, as well as a pretty in-depth flight physical or aviation physical uh, to make sure you're qualified to uh, either fly or operate in the aircraft. So for the Naval Academy, I'm not that familiar with their processes, but it's gonna be very similar to that where there's an entrance exam there's a long physical that you do with the flight surgeon, um, as well as uh, myriad summer cruises that those students might go on where they can interact with, uh, with aviators and actually get to get hands on with, um, with the aircraft, maybe fly it, maybe visit the squadrons, um, things like that. So NROTC, I would argue, has the most exposure possibility to aviation, at least where I currently am. I'm in San Diego. So we constantly are doing site visits to local squadrons, uh, having guest speakers come speak to the students. Um, so those are all great things to do uh, if you're currently a midshipman at a unit that has any sort of proximity to a squadron. Um, I would definitely ask your upperclassmen, um, has this ever been done? Is this something that we do? Um, and then of course your aviation officer uh, as well to provide that mentorship um, and hopefully they could help set up uh, a guest speaker uh, or something like that for you. Um, so we'll go through kind of the, what you'll do each year uh, during your time as a midshipman. I have a list in front of me that I'll look down at sometimes, but uh, essentially I, I was a midshipman. I went to Villanova NROTC, selected uh, student naval flight officer out of there um, and became an NFO in the Navy uh, flying, as you can probably tell from my channel and my other videos. So uh, I'm super passionate about this. I'm very passionate about mentoring uh, young aviators because um, there's not a lot of content out there for, for young people who might be in your position, who might be a student still in college um, for where to go next and what to do uh, to help your chances. So um, something that I tell our, our first year students when they're asking me how they can select aviation and, and what looks good on the application, um, it's, it's really very few things. I, I think do this process while you're a midshipman for yourself. Like try to build tools in your in your toolbox um, that you can use later on, uh, and that would include like attending these uh, site visits or attending the guest speakers. Um, a lot of times you might be forced to go because it's a requirement for a unit, but um, if you're not forced to go, I definitely recommend going. Like uh, expand your mind and and learn something new. That's a great way to do it. Um, and at my unit in San Diego, we visit at least 10 different squadrons uh, each school year. So um, I love seeing my first year students, my fourth class midshipmen uh, going to things like that. Um, and it lets them meet the aviators, get to climb in the aircraft, um, or at least on the wing and look in, um, get some hands on. That, that's huge to me. I think that's a, a huge way to detect if this is on your path or not um, if they, of what you might wanna do. So. Um, as you proceed through NROTC, you're of course required to take physics and calculus. So Calc 1, Calc 2, Physics 1, Physics 2. 
um, both of those being, uh, or more in particular, the physics being physics for engineers. So it's going to be the non-liberal -liber arts, physics and calc that you'll be taking, um, which I know is arduous while you're in it, but it's for a, a greater reason and you will need that later for almost every specialty you might go into, um, but it also just looks really good on your application. It looks great on your transcript um, to take those classes. They're required, so you have to, but um, just try and do your best at those. Uh, that is a great way to uh, lay the groundwork for further success in aviation because those two subjects weigh pretty heavily in your entrance exam to naval aviation, and that's called the ASTB. Uh, so let me see if I have what it means here. I think it's Aviation Selection Test Battery. Let me look it up. I have my computer right here. I administer this, so I should probably know. ASTB. Yes, Aviation Selection Test Battery. Perfect. Okay. So I'm just gonna read through my notes on the ASTB. It's basically like the SAT, um, and I recommend that you take that test right as soon as you finish Physics 2 and Calc 2. So say that is your second semester of your fourth class year or your freshman year, um, maybe take it in the summer. Your instructors are still around in the summer generally, so if you wanna stick around and take it in the summer, that's a great way to do it because all that material is still fresh in your mind. Um, if you finish uh, physics and calc um, sophomore year, like second semester sophomore year, again, you could stick around in the summer, you could stick around for winter break um, and try and deconflict it from the rest of your exams. Uh, that's just in my experience what uh, makes it the most stress-free um, event for the student. Um, but again, take it as soon as you finish those two uh, those two subjects uh, because they will reappear on your ASTB. So uh, for Marine Corps students, uh, Marine Corps applicants for aviation, minimums are four on the academic qualifications rating, the AQR, and six on the pilot flight aptitude rating or the PFAR. Um, flight officer flight aptitude rating does not apply due to Marine Corps no longer having NFOs. Yeah, no more NFOs in the Marine Corps, at least uh, new production NFOs. There are still some that are that are still still fighting the good fight. Um, okay, you should be aiming to have a point or two higher than the minimum. Um, you are only able to apply for an aviation contract once you complete your junior year, or if you're due to commission the next fiscal year. So that means junior year is your juicy target for when you want to apply for aviation as a marine option, midshipman or MESEP. So that's gonna be the year before you're gonna graduate. MESEPs typically do three-year programs um, from what I've seen. So that would be that middle year, your second year, or the year before you graduate um, for your aviation contract. Um, and I don't know too much about what goes on after that application gets submitted, but from what I have been told, uh, if you get picked up for an aviation contract, you no, no longer are competing at the basic school for what your MOS will be. You already know what your MOS will be, which would be uh, SNA or Student Naval Aviator or a, a, like a numbered code for that. Um, so those are the rules for Marine Corps students. Uh, if there's any more questions on that, um, feel free to leave a comment and I'll do my best to get back to you. Uh, I read directly from what the guidance I was given uh, regarding Marine Corps applicants. Um, so that's that. Uh, for Navy students, applicants for pilot training or NFO training, oh, actually, disregard. Uh, the rule is applicants for pilot training must attain a minimum score of four on the academic qualifications rating, the AQR, and a five on the pilot flight aptitude rating. Applicants for naval flight officer training must attain a minimum score of four on the AQR and a five on the flight officer aptitude rating. So when you finish the ASTB exam, your score comes out to you in three parts, and that's uh, what this is referring to here. Uh, students may take the ASTB a maximum of three times, waiting 30 days in between. Only the students' most recent scores will be considered. Um, I like to tell my students that pretty competitive numbers would be like triple sixes or above. So um, you're looking at, once you get your test results back, you're gonna look at three major sections. You wanna see about five, six, seven, uh, or above in those 
categories. Um, I've seen a couple times students will get an eight, an eight is super competitive, sometimes even a nine, a nine is the maximum. I think that's like 99th percentile uh, of score. So I've seen it a few times and um, definitely makes you super competitive for aviation to do as well as you can on that test. Um, and again, you can take it those three times, only your most recent one gets submitted. So if you take it in, um, let's see, July, August, September, and you the application is due in September, which it is for Navy students, uh, that September score is the one that's gonna be submitted. So if you do worse on the September one, that's still gonna be the one that gets submitted. Um, in all of my experience administering this test about 50 times, I've never seen a student backslide in their score. I've seen them remain the same. So uh, my advice is to retake it if you're not happy the first time, uh, because more than likely you're not gonna do any worse. You might stay the same, but if you spend extra time studying, uh, you might even do better. Uh, I think the best way to study for this test is just to take it. It's kind of like the SAT where it's hard to study for. Uh, there are study manuals on Amazon and I had one when I was taking the test. A lot of my students have them. Um, so that's kind of over to you on, are you gonna take it on a whim and not study at all? Or are you gonna prep uh, and read the study manual? But again, I think the best way to study for it is just to take it uh, and then retake it a month later. So why not try that? Um, okay, the best time to take the ASTB is first semester junior year. Um, I added that to this document here, um, just as a general rule for my students that you wanna get this out of the way. Um, your summer between junior and senior year is when the application is complete. So you can't submit any work uh, after that time. So you wanna be done junior year. Junior year is typically the hardest year for a lot of our STEM majors. So why not knock it out before junior year starts? Um, so first semester junior year, but again, I, I stand by Take it as soon as you're done your physics and calc because those topics will be on the test. Um, yep, okay, perfect. So if there's any other questions on ASTB, just leave them in the comments. Uh, I'll probably make a follow-up video to this. Um, some other things to know about the ASTB, you get a scratch paper during the test, so you can't like bring anything in with you. You can't bring a phone, can't bring a smartwatch can't bring your own scratch paper, any books. You kind of just go in clean. You can bring snacks and water, um, but you can't bring in anything else. Um, you'll be sitting at a computer, you'll be on Firefox, and um, the computer program is all run online on Firefox. Um, you'll have video game controllers being, uh, some of the test being um, kind of like a video game. So uh, I haven't taken the test in like 10 years, but parts of the test would include uh, like a, a math section with calculus, physics section, um, reading comprehension. Uh, there's like a personality test, uh, which you definitely can't study for. And then finally, uh, like a video game section. So you use um, your controls, which are video game controls that are gonna be on the table that you take the test at uh, to complete the video game portion. And it's grading you on that. So if you like to play video games, you might be in great luck with the ASTB. Um, so that's kind of cool. But no, no video game experience is required. I never played any video games um, really at all besides Dance Dance Revolution, which uh, was not applicable to this. Um, so yeah, again, you can bring in food and water, you can bring in um, a pencil, but you'll, you're gonna be given a piece of scratch paper or like a, a bunch of pieces of scratch paper. Um, and that's what you can write on to work out the problems. Uh, as soon as you're done the test, that gets shredded by the proctor and you are on your way. All right, so the next thing to do for Navy midshipmen uh, would be to request a first class aviation cruise. Um, this is all pretty simple. Like everyone gets a cruise for your first class cruise and why not uh, request the aviation cruise? Um, especially if that's what you're interested in. Um, you want to go on a cruise for what you're hopefully going to serve a select, so um, request that and you'll more than likely get matched up on, on a fantastic uh, month-long trip to actually kind of embed, embed yourself with a squadron. Uh, I went to Norfolk, Virginia for mine and spent a month at HSC2, which is the fleet replacement squadron for the, uh, the Sierra um, helicopter and uh, MH60 Sierra helicopter. 
and it was probably the best month of my life up to that point. I loved it. I got to fly four times, uh, but my favorite memories included actually just hanging out with the squadron members in the ready room, talking to the students and the instructors. Um, we got to go to some social events with the squadron. So that's kind of what you can expect during your aviation cruise. Um, it's looking to have you understand, okay, do I want to seal the deal with aviation? Is this my first choice or is this just not for me? And I'll go a different route. Um, so I recommend talking to your aviation advisor at your unit about aviation crews, um, maybe any tips that they might have. Um, but again, your, your senior midshipmen would be the best uh, resource for this too, because they just did their first class cruise more than likely. So um, there's so many places you can go. Um, off the top of my head, a lot of people went to uh, Norfolk, Virginia, Oceana, Virginia, um, Woodby Island, Washington, and San Diego. So those are kind of the, the three big places to visit for your cruise. So uh, you might have a wonderful time. Um, and again, you don't have to like qualify other than medically to request a first class aviation cruise. Um, so not much to that. Um, but if you don't go on it and you request aviation, I've never seen anyone I don't think it would necessarily hurt you, but I've never seen anyone get picked up. So hopefully that makes sense. Like you wanna show the community that you want them. Um, so that is that. Any other questions on that, just leave them in the comments. Hopefully that was clear. Uh, okay, so completing timely aviation physicals. There's a physical for your first class cruise and there's a physical for once you actually select aviation. Um, after that, you're gonna go through the long form flight physical. So um, this doesn't have much to do with actually getting selected, but um, I, my advice is to be timely about it because once you select aviation, you say it's you know your senior year, it's um, November or October, and you find out the good news, you're going aviation, you wanna get in that local uh, aviation clinic as soon as you possibly can. Um, because the process for a long form flight physical, especially for a first time applicant, can take up to six months. And you don't wanna delay your commissioning uh, because if you delay your commissioning, you're losing out on thousands of dollars a month in pay. Um, you won't be able to readily afford housing possibly where you go to school. Um, I went to school in the Philly area and even as an ensign, it was very hard to, uh, to afford that. So um, you don't wanna catch yourself without a paycheck. Um, and the best way to avoid that is to get your flight physical done early, um, at least by January of that year. Cause you, you're, you're gonna find out in October or November um, and commission probably in May. So you wanna spend that time um, knocking that out uh, and your, your own unit will have more information for you about that. Um, if you're curious on um, say you're a first year student, like a fourth class midshipman, and you're curious, or am I even qualified to select aviation medically? Um, I'll leave the link below to that, but NAMI is the uh, Naval Aeromedical Institute, I believe. Let me look that one up too. Um, they adjudicate your medical and decide whether or not you are physically qualified to fly. Okay, Naval Aerospace Medical Institute. I'll post a link uh, below this video to their website uh, because they actually post their manuals. So something I use with my students all the time is the NAMI ophthalmology chapter. And that chapter delineates um, if your eye um, prescription is compatible with something that you could take into Naval Aviation or if you would need um, surgery to fix your eyes. Um, I did need surgery and I got mine done junior year. Um, early junior year is the best time for that uh, because it deconflicts from summer cruise and of course from uh, your post commissioning uh, trip to flight school. So we'll talk more about that in just a second, but um, completing those timely. Yeah, I have written down here, aviation physicals shall be initiated seven to eight months prior to commissioning um, or for Marines, seven to eight months prior to applying for an aviation contract. So for Marines, you submit your aviation 
qual letter or whatever your flight surgeon gives you saying that you're qualified um, with your package for an aviation contract. All right. Uh, the one closest to me in San Diego, if you happen to be one of my students, hello. Uh, the one closest to us is going to be the North Island, uh, NAS North Island Aviation Medicine Clinic. So that's the best place to support my students uh, locally here. All right. Uh, yeah, so I, ha I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but for our unit, um, planning or leading club events, planning or leading aviation related events, um, definitely shows your staff that you're serious about aviation. Um, it's simple as that. You, your, your leadership is super important to your class rank as a midshipman, and that's just one idea. Um, yep, so I have written here each semester, uh, our particular aviation club strives to host three events uh, open to the club and our battalion to visit local squadrons and attend significant events. Uh, members are expected to attend all events that do not conflict with class. All events are optional, but highly encouraged. So again, like as, an, as a staff member, I really like to see my students at these events. Um, it shows me how serious they are about aviation. Not that I have much to do with, with that. I don't, I'll be honest. Um, I don't pick who gets it, um, but I do help influence the class rank. And so uh, leadership is, is super important to increasing your, your status on that list. Um, Okay, another good idea for you to do uh, is to apply for aviation scholarships to gain flight experience. Flight experience is by no means a prerequisite at all for naval aviation. Um, I would guess that 70% of naval aviators do not have any flying experience prior to starting flight school. Um, about 30% do, but that's just my rough guess. Um, the majority definitely had no flying training before. Um, so if you know of any flying training scholarships that your unit puts out to you, or if you just do a quick Google search for flight training scholarships, there's a lot out there. Um, so even if you do one flight, like one discovery flight, um, that's something that you can include on your application um, because the application for um, service assignment does ask you if you have any flying experience. So. Um, take that for what it is. Um, I wouldn't, you know, take out a loan to do that, or I wouldn't, I don't know, take money I was going to use on groceries and spend it on flying lessons. Um, the Navy doesn't want you to do that. It's more important to have leadership in your battalion and to get good grades. Um, those are always going to be your, your number one things to help you throughout your career in NROTC. Okay. Next topic is going to be eye surgery. So uh, I mentioned the NAMI ophthalmology chapter earlier, and I will post that below. Um, section 12.15 displays um, the waiver guide. So it'll tell you, okay, what is your eye prescription? Uh, if you don't know what your eye prescription is, it might be good to visit an optometrist um, to find out. And you can literally bring the chapter in with you when you go see the optometrist and ask them, okay, which of these parameters do I fall into? Um, and they would let you know, okay, you're showing uh, this particular score, this particular prescription, and per this document, it tells you you need surgery uh, to qualify. So um, you might have some elective surgery paperwork with your unit. Uh, you definitely wanna brief your advisor on your plan to get surgery before you get surgery um, because there's a, a process to go through um, for that approval. It, it, it always gets approved, never seen it not get approved, um, but you just have to say that, okay, if something goes wrong and I'm no longer qualified to serve in the Navy, um, I understand this is a risk I'm taking, uh, etc. because um, the eye surgery is procured through yourself. The Navy doesn't pay for that for NROTC midshipmen, it does for Naval Academy midshipmen, but not um, not NROTC because you're still under your parents' um, insurance or some other plan through your school. Um, pretty much every college student has to be uh, under insurance, whether it's belonging to your parent or guardian or um, your university. So 
um, you would find out more about that uh, from your insurance provider. Um, other ways to go about that, to pay for it. I remember when I got my surgery, my family and I got a um, low interest medical credit card and that's how we paid for my eye surgery. So um, those are all things to think about. Um, and normally a consultation is a very low, low fee um, for your eye surgery. Uh, but again, that NAMI document will tell you which refractive surgeries you're allowed to get. Um, off the top of my head, it's PRK, LASIK, and SMILE are the three that are uh, encouraged to get. Um, but more info on that is in the document. Um, with your NRTC unit, you'll have to again file that elective surgery paperwork. It's going to include uh, the following eye exams or results, your pre-op exam, same day post-op, one week post-op, one month post-op, three months post-op, and six months post-op. So it's important to know that you're met down or can't fly for six months past your eye surgery. I'm not talking about commercial flights, it's about flying in a naval aircraft. So that's why you want to get this done for a semester junior year because your recovery takes six months. You don't want that to impact your cruise. You wanna go on summer cruise, on first class cruise and have the best time ever flying and getting on the flight schedule as much as possible and, and hang out with your squadron. Um, you don't want to lose that opportunity because of um, poorly timed eye surgery. So uh, hopefully that all makes sense. Um, so those are kind of the ways that you can help your application. Um, and just to recap, it's Big thing, going on your first class aviation cruise, taking your ASTB in a timely manner uh, when calc and physics is still fresh in your mind, um, maybe leading or at attending aviation related events at your unit. Um, what else did I mention? Timely physicals, club events. Oh yeah, scholarships if you're interested in actually flying a small aircraft at your local flight school, local civilian flight school, uh, you can always apply for aviation scholarships, not required by any means. Um, most of my friends did not do that, but um, if that's something you're interested in, for uh, my unit, we actually had one student uh, last summer, I believe, uh, get a full scholarship to get his solo. So he got his first solo, um, all that ground training, all that exam time, uh, flight time, then finally solo. Um, I would ballpark it to be worth like $14,000 maybe, uh, but he got that all paid for by the Daedalians Flying Training Scholarship. So there are scholarships out there that could really help uh, you get some flight training experience. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about, um, okay, so you've done all these things, you've found out the good news, senior year, you're gonna be in an SNA or SNFO um, and after you graduate, there might be a few months of waiting until you report to Pensacola. Uh, if you do have time to wait, and it's about six months or more, uh, which it is for many people, um, you might want to go TAD. So that's uh, no cost TAD is what you'd be asking for. Um, let me look up what TAD is. So many acronyms today, you guys. TAD, maybe. Okay, temporary additional duty is what TAD is. I'm trying to define everything in case we have any non-military listeners here. Um, so you can request no-cost TAD uh, with a squadron. So say you go to Norfolk for your first class cruise and you have a great time, you make a lot of connections in your squadron that you're assigned to and you really want to go back and help kind of like as an intern. Um, you can always ask them. You want to ask your command, so ask your own NRTC unit if you can do that. Um, that would be asking your your um, officer, instructor, or class advisor, whatever the case may be, uh, asking them if that's okay to pursue. Because sometimes your ROTC unit still has plans for you after you commission, um, and they know that they're going to hold on to you for a few months. So they, they might have plans on things they want you to do. Not, it's not all the time that you can go do this, but ask if they say yes, which they probably will, um, then you can reach out to that squadron that you were at before and say, hey, I'm gonna be a stashed ensign for a few months here. Do you mind if I 
get stationed with you all or get attached to you all for three months, four months. And if they say yes to, then you have yourself a deal. Um, housing is the last thing to figure out. Um, I'll tell you a bit about what I did. So um, I went to Villanova, like I mentioned. Um, after I commissioned, I had about eight months uh, until, well, maybe not eight months, like seven months until I reported to Pensacola. During that time, I was able to get no cost TAD orders to VX23 in Patuxent River, Maryland. So um, that was a dream come true, total dream job. Um, and I got to kind of intern there for a few months and it, it really added a lot to my professional outlook and still the things I learned then are very special to me and I hope to go back into it a little bit back into flight test. Um, but the opportunities are endless. Um, I think asking people for their advice is never wrong. That's what I hope to provide to you today. So thank you for watching. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please leave them below. I tend to over talk and circle back a bunch of times on things. I'm working on my communication skills. I tell my students that all the time. Um, but again, thank you for watching and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.